This episode of The Curbsiders is brought to you by MixApp, ACP's medical knowledge self-assessment program. Visit www.acponline.org forward slash MKSAP Curbsiders when you order. The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. I guess we could start off saying welcome back to the Curbsiders. Uh, uh, <laughs> Just shameless pandering. <laughs> well, Paul, once again, I will I will point out that I am perfectly comfortable. This feels totally natural. Completely normal. Yes. Glad to be here. So uh, let's tell people, uh, you've already heard, we are going to be talking about the struggling learner today. Paul, in case some of these people haven't heard the show before, can you tell them uh, what is it that we do on this show? Yeah, and it's, I, as I always say, I often ask myself, and then um, Casey was nice enough to steal my line. We are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We bring you experts, interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. For some reason that is inexplicable and opaque to me, sometimes we are asked to actually do this in front of groups of people, um, which we are thrilled to do today. Uh, Stuart. Oh, hi, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> Stuart's here. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing well. All right. Did you have anything to say? Uh, just a few brief things. I think most people in the audience already know who we are. I will probably skip over the next few slides, but uh, essentially, um, so we're the the podcast, the Internal Medicine Podcast. I just uh, got some examples of what the show notes look like. If you don't know what they look like, they are very professionally done. Um, they are put together by a team of uh, more than 20 individuals, including graphic artists and producers and lots of really cool little things and tidbits that you can get from our show notes, including some strange cartoons from uh, Kate Grant up uh, over in UK. So that's our actually one of two international uh, team members now. So kind of like uh, Louisville International Airport that has maybe one flight to an international airport. Uh, similarly, we have uh, two international uh, members of our team. So um, so our show today was uh, produced by yours truly. I will have to say that, unfortunately, I've only had four hours of sleep, and my breakfast this morning was four grapes. <laughs> and so... Um, Very true. Yeah, that's really all it was. And uh, so I, I, this, is a, this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, and partially because as an academic physician and as the father of teenage children. I've got a 16-year-old daughter, a 17-year-old daughter, and three other kids that kind of fall in there somewhere. Um, you know, I, I always find myself uh, struggling with what to do with learners that, that are having a difficult time. So I just want to ask everyone in the audience, who in the audience thinks that they struggle with learning in any way, shape, or form? Right. <laughs> it should be almost every hand. And in fact, one of the things that uh, kind of brings this to the forefront, and, and I encourage you after the show to go to YouTube and search for this. It's a TED Talk by Terry Moore. It says, how to tie your shoes. Now, the problem is you don't know what you don't know. And oftentimes it's difficult for us to determine what is it that we know incorrectly. And it requires that external viewpoint into who we are to help to identify those things that are maladaptive. And so um, in this show today, we're going to talk about, hopefully with some clarity, what to do with the struggling learner and provide valuable tools, tips, and techniques, because uh, I love alliteration, <laughs> uh, that will help to identify what we can actually do about this. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, who's going to introduce our speaker or our guest. <laughs> you know, both. And we are thrilled to be talking to someone I'm sure that you all know well, Dr. Melissa McNeil. And I'm going to tell you all about her, not in one breath, because I don't think I could. I would die on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. McNeil received her undergraduate degree from Princeton University, her MD degree from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And then we pause for applause. <laughs> Thank you. And a master's of public health from the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. She's a professor of medicine, obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive science, and clinical and translational science. That's a lot of stuff. 
Dr. McNeil currently serves as the Associate Chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine and the Vice Chair of Education for the Department of Medicine. She is also the Chief of the Section of Women's Health within the Division of General Internal Medicine. She is an inaugural member of the Academy of Master Educators at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She has been widely recognized, both locally and nationally, for achievements in women's health and education. From the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, she has received the Charles Watson Award for Teaching Excellence, the Donald S. Fraley Award for Student Mentoring, and the Schuett Award for Master Educator. Most recently, she was named the Society of General Internal Medicine's Distinguished Professor of Women's Health and received the Society of General Internal Medicine's Career Achievement in Medical Education in 2016. Over 80 residents and 30 fellows have graduated from her women's health educational programs, have gone on successful careers in academic women's health. And without further ado, we are thrilled to have with us Dr. Melissa McNeil. Dr. McNeil, is it okay if we call you Missy from here please, on out? Please, please. All right. Thank you. First question, can you tell the audience, they've just heard your wonderful introduction. Can you tell them, who are you as a person? Give them a little bit of a one-liner, maybe include a hobby outside of medicine. So I would describe myself as an ageless and seasoned <laughs> totally agree. Sure. clinician and educator um, with a passion for clinical reasoning. I have two daughters, one granddaughter and another one on the way, due in January. And one of my um, passions this time of year is actually decorating the house for the holidays. I have three Christmas trees up and can't even imagine um, when the fourth will arrive. Uh, you could be best friends with my wife. <laughs> we only have two Christmas trees, but uh, all right. We barely have one. Yeah, that's still, yeah. Two still feels like a lot to me. Yeah, we, we give one to the kids to decorate because it's not decorated up to, you know. Standards. Up to standards. Standards, yes. Only totally. about halfway up the tree, probably. Totally. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> All right, the, the most uh, anxiety-provoking question, usually, uh, I'm going to ask my typical, what, what book do you think every physician should read? So it doesn't even have to be medical, but just give us a book recommendation. So this was stressful. I roamed <laughs> around the house this morning, looking at my bookshelves. And actually, the one that I'm going to pick is a book called Radical Candor by Kim Scott, which is all about the importance of giving feedback, which seems relevant to our topic today. So, um, and the, the theory behind it is that you don't do anyone any favors if you don't allow them to grow from feedback. So I highly recommend it to everybody. Excellent. That sounds great. Um, I'm not going to ask about your fit, your best advice, because that's essentially the whole show. <laughs> so instead, I'd rather ask you about what was your favorite failure, or if you're able to think on your feet, um, your most memorable patient complaint, which could be your favorite failure, and what you learned from that? Oh, um, my most memorable patient complaint. That's a hard one. Um, the, actually, the most memorable patient complaint, I was it, early in my career, I was working um, full time at the VA, and I had a gentleman who presented with foot pain. They wheeled him in in his wheelchair. And, of course, I said, well, I need to see your foot, you know, so please take your foot out of the shoe. And he took his foot out of the shoe, and the cockroaches came out of his oh my shoe. God. And so um, it, I'm not sure what I learned from it, but it was quite <laughs> memorable. It was quite memorable, to say the least. Careful what you wish for, yeah, exactly, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That story know where is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our show. Um, thank you all for coming. <laughs> I, I wanted to swing back actually to the Radical Candor book. And if I, I read, I didn't read the full book, uh, full disclosure, but I remember we talked to Gurpreet Dhaliwal about, he talked about a little bit about giving feedback to colleagues. And he talked about having like an emotional bank account where he would give lots of kudos to people so that when he did give hard feedback, it was taken better. I think there was something like that in there. Like they had to know, you can't just be radically. Oh, tr they you know, have giving to feedback. You care. They have to believe you, you have care. To believe I think you that was care. like a, a a key piece of that of that whole thing, rather than just like radically telling everyone like you suck today. <laughs> um, Indeed, you have to. Ha but, you and earn the next that piece first. is, and I will help you not suck. Yeah. Right? I mean, so it has to be connected to the. This is the problem, and let me help you. But you know, I think we handicap ourselves by not wanting people to feel bad, and I'll just. Um, offer the thought that if you don't care enough about somebody to want to help them get better, 
that's what not giving feedback means. It means I don't mm. think you can get better and I don't care enough to help you. So sometimes hard feedback is what people need to hear. And in case you didn't know, uh, Dr. Gurpreet Dhaliwal has the most followed Twitter account with zero tweets and I think absolutely no description either. <laughs> <laughs> He's, for, uh, that's, uh, for those of you where this isn't about uh, social media today, but uh, if you're on Twitter and you don't tweet, you're called a lurker, that's, uh, which I thought is a pretty, pretty uh, aggressive term. So, <laughs> Paul, uh, why don't you bring us into the show? We're kind of already there. So Did you want to do the picks of the week or just skip it? Oh yeah, we could uh, sure. we could Probably do picks hard. of the week. I think okay. I think time wise. So so if the audience isn't following along, which you probably aren't, because this is the only the second time we've done this. So um, for the live shows, what I do for picks of the week is that I ask Matt and Paul what the pick of the week is, and I make up a random one that might describe what they like better. So uh, so Paul's pick of the week, what he told me was Knives Out is his pick of, pick of the week, and then uh, I'm following on to that saying Clue. So which one would you pick, Clue the movie or Knives Out and why? Yeah, and I, I wasn't prepared for this. That's a tough one, because Knives Out is great. So that's still a recommendation. I would have to go with Clue. It's one of those movies that, if it's on TV, I will stop every time and watch it until the end. Like, it doesn't matter. And there's, like, three different... Yeah, thank you. I think... <laughs> thank you. All right. These people get it. I, I, I like those it here. Two. So, yeah. Those two. Those no, I, <laughs> two. Right. I'm general. I think, I think all these people get it. I, all right. Yeah. So, so for Paul, I'm two of two so far, yeah, if no. you're counting. All right, so uh, for Matt, we've got his pick, which was uh, Awareness, the book. And if you don't like that one, Matt, you can choose uh, Watto from Star Wars. <laughs> oh. So uh, there was some, you know, the, the, the character <laughs> Watto was a little bit problemsome for my, for my family. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I will say this. My, my family name was Vataha, and it was, it was changed when my, my uh, great grand, great-great-grandparents came to this country to Watto, which I think is easier, you know, so I get it. We've, we like the name now. But then George <laughs> Lucas came out with this character who uh, some of my other friends pointed out there's some problem, pro- uh, troubling stereotypes uh, portrayed in Watto, yeah, which... No. I don't particularly agree with. So I'll go with the book Awareness. And uh, on a more serious note, that's a book that I recently read and found very helpful, probably especially at this time of year. I would say it's written by a Catholic priest who seems like he's from India or he's give, and he's went around giving lectures. But it's more, uh, he's more talking about just the concept of like mindfulness and awareness and seeing that some of the errors in your thinking, it's, it's definitely not a religious book. It's, it's more just in the, along the lines of kind of mindfulness. And I find that I was telling Paul on the, drive, on the drive in here, I pretty much need to constantly read books about mindfulness in order to re- maintain some sort of like sanity in my life. And so I would highly recommend that book. It's a quick read. I think it's, it's under 200 pages, very short chapters. So you can feel like you're, you're really cranking through it. All right. And then my pick of the week is straightforward. It's just The Expanse on Amazon. I, I love uh, sci-fi. And if you like the science part of sci-fi, I love The Expanse. I think you, you would too. And I, I, this is not just a plug out there. This, this show is amazing. I love it. I wanted to remind you that this episode is sponsored by MixApp, ACP's medical knowledge self-assessment program. This is the internal medicine go-to resource for continuous learning and board preparation. I've said this before, but it is such a pleasure to go through MixApp. I had a lot of fun. Maybe I'm just an internal medicine nerd, but I had a lot of fun studying for my boards, going through the MixApp questions. There are now over 3,000 board-like multiple choice questions in MixApp. You can go through them at your own pace in study mode, or you can use exam mode and take time tests. So what are you waiting for? You know you love MixApp. Go to www.acponline.org forward slash MKSAP curbsiders when you order. All right. So at this point, we will get to we will get to the topic. We'll start off with a case, and we are going to leave time at the end for questions. So please, audience, uh, Stuart will come out into the audience with with the mic, and uh, you can you can ask questions to Missy. And uh, I'm, I hope hopefully we will have some questions. All right, let's go. All right, let's talk about Arnie Wright, who is a budding MS3, has done well in medical school thus far, and overall has not had any struggles until recently taking USMLE Step 2 CK and failed for the very first time. Um, Now, Arnie is having difficulty transitioning to the wards, routinely finds that he just doesn't seem to grasp a whole lot of the concepts that are are being discussed. Um, And so I guess, broadly speaking, 
you know, how do we define this and sort of where do we start with Arnie? How can we best help? Um, is there possibly a five-step might process? Might be a five-step yeah. approach. There is a five-step process that we can talk about. So I think, you know, this is the kind of um, comment that somebody stops you in the hall and saying says, hey, I've got Arnie on my service and he's just not getting it. And so, and that as an educator, as someone who's trying to help a learner, that's not very helpful, right? So just not getting it doesn't tell you where you need to go. So one of the, the things we have sort of advocated here, tried to, to uh, um, set up as an approach to this, is to think about the approach to the struggling learner just like you would the approach to a patient. And you begin, first of all, with a patient, with getting the key clinical findings. So when we ask you to think about a learner, tell me specifically what you mean. Not, just not getting it doesn't tell me. Not getting it could mean I don't have the right information. I don't have the history and physical. Not getting it could mean I can't identify which things are important. It may mean I can't then go from there to a problem list. Could mean my differentials are not complete or are too complete. So you need to be very specific. And what, what we ask you to do first is to name the behavior and then decide which of the behaviors becomes, if you will, your chief complaint. Once you have a, a chief complaint, there are lots of buckets that a certain behavior can go in. So somebody who, for example, can't seem to develop a differential diagnosis, let's say maybe that's the problem. Well, is that, again, because they have a knowledge-based problem, they don't have the basic knowledge, which in our learner who failed step two CK, we would worry about. Is that somebody who can't synthesize that knowledge? Is that someone who has an organizational deficit and just can't seem to put it together? Has the information when you ask them the questions? And then we always start to worry about the professionalism bucket. And by that, I mean a, a, a learner whose behaviors are not meeting the norms. And I think in particular I want to highlight this bucket because we often say this kid has a professionalism problem. But in point of fact, they have a problem of being late or not doing their work in a timely fashion. And that has a huge differential. Anxiety, depression, ADD, problems at home. It's hard to know. So once you get the bucket, you ask the questions to help you with your differential diagnosis, and then you come back to the learner and you think a little bit about trying on your illness script. It's exactly the same as you would do with clinical reasoning. I am worried that this learner has problems with knowledge. That's why he's not getting it. So then I go and I ask questions to try and get more information. And in terms of how, even more broadly, just how you discuss, so I, I think we titled this The Struggling Learner, um, but in terms of how we even discuss the learner who maybe needs extra help or who is sort of not meeting expectations, does it matter, sort of like it, rather than saying this is a bad resident or, um, or this is someone who, who doesn't get it, is there, does it matter how we discuss them and sort of what's the best way to actually even sort of start by broadly framing the conversation? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the term, we used to talk about problem learners, which has stigma. Now we frame them as struggling learners. And we, if you'll remember, we started the podcast by saying, who has struggles learning? All of us have struggles learning at different times along the way. And I would say that the job of us as educators is actually to help the learner who's struggling. You know, it's easy to teach people who get it, who, are, who, who have exceptional knowledge and can see the forest for the trees right away. It's a little bit hard sometimes to take the good to great, but really the job of the educator is to help make sure that we can identify, name, and help our learners so that everybody gets to the good. Yeah, I'm so glad. I'm so glad we're doing this this topic, and we talked a, a little bit about this beforehand. I think, and certainly, I've been guilty of this coming up through periods of my training, where you work with somebody, and you're yeah, you're happy about your team because everybody's doing their job, no one's struggling, Except and it feels one. good. But when you when you have someone that's struggling, a lot of the times people just get written off. No one gives them the feedback. That's difficult feedback, or 
people kind of whisper about that person, but they don't, they don't ever get help for it. And it's, it's, it's the hard thing to do to attack this head on. And so I, I just think it's such an important topic and we need to most, the, one other point real quick is that most people that are training our trainees, they, they're getting paid to do that, but they never have been formally trained on what's the right way to give feedback, what's the right way to diagnose a learner, and that's why we wanted to do this show. So actually, let me ask, if you don't mind, so it's, you mentioned sort of, I'm just going to, I'll just, I'll take the reins, it's fine. Um, so, <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Sure, happy to do it. In terms of sort of defining what the issue is, I think in the, the paper that we're referencing, and that we'll, we'll certainly include notes, and I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, talk about going through the history of the present illness and even sort of a very sort of structured approach to sort of how you're diagnosing what the problem mm-hmm. is. Do you mind kind of talking us through that a little bit, sort of the QPRST? Because mm-hmm. um, I thought that was really helpful when I was kind of reading through. Yeah, I think, you know, when, when you think about um, the, the way I approach this with a learner is I first allow them to present, hmm. right? Because you get to the issues of the anxiety of the presentation. And perhaps they just don't have it organized, but they have all the information. Once I start, I get the information that they give me, the next way to approach it is to ask your clarifying questions. And the clarifying questions um, can begin just with, tell me more about the chest pain. It's striking, at least for me, how often our learners actually don't get the illness script. You know, this is that piece about, I mean, here's here's, um, one of my favorite HPIs. Patient presented to the ER with chest pain. CTA showed a pulmonary embolism, and oh, they're yeah, now sure. admitted, right? Yeah. And so, so part <laughs> of what you do is you go back and you say, "Well, okay, but tell me, tell me what you know, tell me what you were thinking about." And some of this then becomes the agenda of trying to have them flesh out their illness scripts. I think the concept of illness scripts is where it's all about. What we do as clinicians is an individual finding will trigger for you a diagnosis. And we see that a lot. But then you have to try that diagnosis on. And it's looking for the pertinent positives and negatives about each diagnosis. So I tell my learners that a great H&P, I should know at the end of that H&P exactly what your differential is going to be. For example, if you think endocarditis is in your differential, on your physical exam, I'll know it because you tell me about Ross plots and splinter lesions and, 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 and um, Osler's nodes, which you wouldn't tell me if they were coming in with dysuria. But if you tell me all those things, I think what a smart learner you are because you thought about the diagnosis, you went and looked it up to see what findings you had to ask about, and then you went back and got it. So role modeling that back and forth that iterative process, probing why did you say, why did you think this was important? Why did you include this? What else is missing? Allows you to get their reasoning. And where exactly are you doing this? Are you doing this on the fly, on the wards? Are you doing this in a a dedicated session with the learner? Where are you doing it at? Yeah, I think it depends a little bit how you're structured for your teaching. Um, I think that I'm a big believer in real-time feedback. I think that we all mean to go, and, and there's folks are, are somewhat anxious about giving real-time feedback because they feel that they'll make the learner feel bad. The reality of it is we all mean to circle back. We all mean to come back and give the feedback, but then you get called somewhere, something happens, and the moment is lost. So you have to learn to give feedback in real time. How much I can probe these kind of things depends a little bit on the setting. If we're doing walk rounds, I can do some of it. I pick my, pick my issues. We here will also do afternoon rounds. Or if I have a learner that's really struggling, I make them present to, they can present to me new case, present to me at the end of the day, over the phone at night. So I think both scenarios are relevant real time and or the one on one. But either way, you got to give feedback. And the feedback, if it's if it's critical feedback, 
what do you, how do you handle that in front of the team? Do you, do you kind of pull them aside afterwards? So I think there's two ways to give feedback. One is um, when you're doing sort of asking them, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? And you get a diagnosis that doesn't really fit. Um, I think it's okay to say, tell me why you thought about that diagnosis. Tell me what fits, what doesn't fit, to probe their reasoning and to to pull it out. We um, teach here and like the language of your 80% of the way there, right? Great. Close. 80% of the way there. So that gives the positive. Sometimes, you know, you're 60%. <laughs> right. Sometimes you're 20%, yeah. you know. Sometimes, thanks for being in the game, <laughs> right. you know. Yeah. Um, a good start. <laughs> right, right. Um, but that allows us to continue the conversation. If I need to give more specific feedback, uh, my problem learner is always Fred. So I would pull Fred aside and I would say, Fred, I was worried that your organization was not what I needed it to be. I think it's really important when things are not said correctly or the thinking's muddy that you correct it in real time. Because not only does the learner need to learn it, but everybody else in the room may walk away with a wrong piece of information in their head. Wow, Fred said this, Dr. McNeil didn't correct him. Maybe that's right. And we subscribe also to the concept right is right. So if you say something wrong, we're going to correct you in real time. Any other phrases you found helpful to bring that up other than the, okay, I, I 50% agree, yeah. or 50% of yeah. the way there, but let's, do you ask leading questions or do you, or do you have other phrases you throw in? So it, you know, I, some, I mean, it's the classic Socratic method, right? You try to go backwards and ask them to get something right and then you can move on. When someone has, the challenge is when someone has said something and it's hanging in the room and it's not right. We, so we talk about the 80% of the way there. We talk about, um, thanks so much for saying that. That's the same mistake I made when I first <laughs> learned about this, right? You know, and, and the learner's kind of like, oh, you know. <laughs> wow, that's so great. I said that wrong thing, you know. So, <laughs> so, you know, so the idea is to make the correction, have the learning moment, but not embarrass or demoralize the learner. These tactics are insanely practical. I hope uh, I hope no one that I work with is listening, so I can. <laughs> super solid wrong answer. I like where your head's at. Right. Uh, so we can all learn from this. Thanks so much for going down that road. Yeah. For uh, for people who haven't done this sort of thing before, uh, so we we talked about the five step framework. Do you have any other? I know Stuart has some tools that that he's used. Do you have any other go to tools or? resources for f faculty that are listening? You know, I think, to be honest, I think it's about faculty development. I mean, one of the things that we do here is we do a thing called MedEd Morning Report, mm -hmm. where we bring a lot of our faculty together, and we, 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 we role model this five-step problem. We have mm -hmm. someone present a case that they struggled with, and then we just brainstorm it. What do you think the problems are? What information would you want to get? And so it's, we actually help each other. So peer support actually using this framework and then the strategies of going back are really important. How, how do you develop the differential? Like it's, I, I feel like the hardest part is kind of naming, I mean, naming the behavior or sort of being specific. A lot of the times you're with a trainee or a learner and you're like, this doesn't feel right or they're not quite... I feel like something's amiss here, but I can't quite put my finger on it. How do you sort of revise and, and create that concrete differential so you can actually then remedy whatever it is that you yeah, found? I have to say, I find the hardest thing for beginning faculty is to name the behavior. They want to name it. They, they're not, they don't know anything. They can't put it together. They're, they have a professionalism issue. You know, and that's actually, those are farther down the line. We really push hard about naming the, be concrete, name the behavior and give me examples. When you um, talk to me about chest pain and you told me that it was, uh, you know, the think about illness scripts that don't match or poorly defined illness scripts or the inability to compare and contrast. So really naming what the problem is. And the only way you know that is to probe. You got to ask questions. 
Stuart, were you going to? Yeah, I, I was just thinking that, you know, sitting on the CCC myself for, mm. I don't know, five or six years, one of the concerns I always run into when reviewing evaluations, it, it almost seems as though a lot of faculty just kind of push it on. Evaluations are not great half the time. The other half of the time, um, there's a lot of almost like system one thinking, knee jerk saying, uh, did poorly on X, Y, or Z, but there's not a concrete plan or there's nothing helpful. I don't want to say there's nothing. Um, It's those unique evaluations when someone actually, you can tell they took the time. It's a little bit lengthy, but it actually explains the behavior, goes through it, says, this is what we did. This was our plan. And that takes a lot of time. It does. And it's difficult to find that time, not just to provide that feedback to the resident, but also to effectively train our staff. How have you found uh, an effective way to reach out to staff who were, were not necessarily, you know, reimbursing for this time? This is, you know, come in, get some faculty development. How do you ensure that your staff are effectively trained to provide something like this? Yeah, I, I think, you know, faculty development is sort of the key of a strong educational program across the board. You know, how you're an effective teacher, how you give feedback, and how you do remediation. Um, so I think that we uh, spend a fair amount of time in faculty development. You know, we we are fortunate that we have um, a medical education fellowship. We have courses in these um, topics that many of our faculty are taking. And then we come together once a week and we talk about the skill set. I will tell you that even with developing the faculty expertise, one of the things that is the hardest is to find the time to remediate. I th- I think that I- identifying the problem is, is probably three quarters of the battle, but you can kind of do that in real time, I think, if you learn to ask the right questions. The remediation is quite challenging. Organizational issues are a huge problem because you got to go watch somebody. Like, I don't, why are you, why are you writing your notes at 11 o'clock at night? Like, I have no idea why you're doing that. You know, and so somebody has to watch you and go through it. One of the things that we developed here that has been hugely helpful is we have, um, a teaching certificate for our residents. And one of the opportunities each resident who's in that teaching certificate, who's participating in their own faculty development, we have monthly seminars for them, but they do a rotation called resident as teacher. And so during that time, we we partner with them and they teach clinical reasoning to our medical students and do lots of different things. But it gives us a body. It gives us a PGY3 body who doesn't have competing clinical demands that I can deploy to go watch my struggling learner, to figure out. And this person, are utilizing our residents this way has been phenomenal. And I have to say, we didn't design it with this in mind. This was just sort of a lucky accident, but it's been wonderful because these residents are not evaluative, right? It's always a challenge when the person remediating you is also your evaluator, Right. So it's, you know, finding, and, and that person is, you know, low on the totem pole, but actually probably knows better than any of us how to manage the chart and how to get the work done and can tell it, can report back to us what the problems are. So maybe, maybe we can use Arnie, Arnie Wright sure. or Arnie Wright as a, as an example here. And bad puns. I hate it. And let, bad puns. Let's yeah. say what what type of problem? What what type of bucket do we want to? What 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 we had a differential? We what do we think? What bucket do we want to put them in? Can we give an example maybe of what a remediation plan might mm-hmm. look like? And at the remediation point, is that coming from the the CCC, the Clinical Competency Committee, this group of people that meets and talks about the trainees who are struggling? Well, ideally, it comes from initially from the team working with the learner to begin with. Okay, so it could come from the attending I, I mean, I the... think you, you ideally it starts with, here's your problem, here's what I want you to do. Right. Let me see if you can get better. So with Arnie, I would be worried, knowing he failed step two, um, that 
there were knowledge based problems. Yeah. And so I would try to confirm that a little bit by probing, asking questions, asking questions about illness scripts. What it, if, if you're thinking this gentleman has a pulmonary embolism, tell me what the history would look like. What would you find on exam? You know, just asking questions. Right. Um, if it turns out that that's where they're stuck, then I think what you do, what you have to do, is you have to frame the reading for them. Mm -hmm. These are learners who, when you tell them to go read, I mean, you talk to a learner, and what's their least favorite feedback? Read more, yeah, right? Um, and so I don't think you can just say read more. I think you have to say, these are the two diseases we're going to be considering about this patient. I want you to go home and read about them. And these are the questions I want you to answer. What would be different in the illness script? So you're giving them focused readings. You're giving them questions to see if they can pull the information out. Because if a learner doesn't know the facts, maybe it's because they're not reading the right thing. Maybe it's because they don't know how to organize the information. And so telling them what to read and telling them the questions to ask that gives them a framework can sort that out. But maybe it's because they have a learning disability that they're, that they could keep up with until they got to the wards and life got busy. Maybe it's because they're depressed. And even though you ask those questions, they don't disclose. So what I want to see with my Arnie, is here's a knowledge deficit. I want you to go read about it and see if you can answer these questions. And depending on how they do with that, gives me a lot of information about where I need yeah. to go. So to summarize, you're the let's say you're working with this person on a clinic block or on, on the wards for two weeks, you would start to work with them there, try to diagnose them, give them some sort of remediation plan on that micro level, and then from there... It goes back to the competency committee. But ideally, you can say whether they improved or not. Yeah. Now, a, a learner who comes to you with a huge knowledge deficit, that's horrible, right? Because you have to make the decision about whether to stop forward progression till they catch up. You also have to give the tough message that if you're going to progress, stay in your clerkships or on the wards, you have to work doubly hard, right? This, I mean, we're talking hours a night that you have to put into this because you're behind. Yeah. There's no easy fix. You know, and, and there, there actually is a tool that our colleagues at USU developed. I think that this is a decent segue into it. It is very time consuming, but I've used it to right. remediate residents who uh, have difficulty on the uh, in-service exams or uh, for some of our staff who have failed board examinations. Um, and so the utility of this is that it, it actually helps to differentiate multiple different differential diagnoses. While you may think it's a medical knowledge deficit, this could uh, uncover things like premature closure, underconfidence, so you're underrating your confidence to a certain question, and then you read the, the, the multiple choice answers, and then you change your, your answer because you are not confident in your answer in the first place. Uh, there's multiple different things that can point towards different differential diagnoses from the medical knowledge standpoint. Again, this is very time consuming, but it is something that can be helpful to rem remediate someone who has already been identified as having struggles with standardized tests. This is currently being used to evaluate potential clinical reasoning deficits right now, but most of the data that we have is based on standardized test taking right now. Again, this is not something that you'd pull out on the ward and say, hey, let's go through these 16 questions. That would take a long time. But it is still useful. But I, th I think, you know, and, and I, I like the tool. I think it's really helpful. But I also think you don't have to use the whole tool. Right. Even, on, even in a rapid-fire clinical setting, I think you can probe. Tell me why you pick this as your top differential. What fits, what doesn't fit, what's missing for this differential. And then some of it is surprising how, pay, how learners know the information. Mm -hmm. They just haven't learned how to compare and contrast illness scripts right. or to prioritize the key findings. So I think you can do bits of it in real time. 
I imagine this is probably helpful because I feel like we run into this disconnect a lot where someone is, as opposed to the case of Arnie here, like a rock star on the floor. It's like knows their patient, the patient identifies them as their doctor, their clinical reasoning seems superb, and then they're just, quote, not a good test taker. And I feel like that's often a hard thing to sort of address because you're not, like it just, it seems so not reflective of your experience and practicality. So maybe this might help guide some remediation with that too. It, it, it's almost like we put everyone into one large bucket. It's like saying everyone who presents with shortness of breath has shortness of breath. You know, individuals like Arnie who fail a test, it's like, oh, yeah, they have a medical knowledge deficit, but you've got to delve further into it is what I'm hearing from you. Totally. And, you know, and sometimes it is just as simple as not enough time on task. But sometimes, you know, we talk a lot about in the first two years, especially in the medical school, you learn about pneumonia and you learn about asthma and you learn about lung cancer. You don't learn about cough. And most learners can make that switch. Most learners can shuffle the information. But there are many learners who just get stuck trying to, and they, they, in my experience, these are the ones who will do a premature closure. They hear one symptom in one setting and they go right to the diagnosis. We were talking um, in one of the, um, sessions I ran this week about a patient who presented somewhat confused who had end-stage liver disease. And so the immediate diagnosis was hepatic encephalopathy, right? Which is what you would think. And I was pushing the um, students, it was a teaching case um, outside of clinical realm. And the patient was actually not, didn't have a decreased sensorium and was making things up to fill in gaps, huh. which to me then was, of course, cost psychosis, right? But it was liver disease patient, and, and we all do this, right? Because time is short and you have to move on. But just asking some of those questions, and when you ask the questions, then learners start to put it together. I like the our, our uncle Bob, our our chair of medicine at Cashlack, uh, Bob Centaur. He he, we talked, we did a, a show on pneumonia, and he made the point that when the when the emergency department calls out a case of pneumonia, he like he assumes it's not pneumonia, and then he'll try to look for information that might convince him that it, that it could be pneumonia. And I think that's probably the right way to go. Uh, so totally. avoid the what premature fits, closure. What doesn't with that. It, because you know the emergency room just needs to decide in or out. Right. Yeah. And so once they and and patients evolve over time. Right. Sure. So what may have been very reasonable at six o'clock at night is very different the next day. Yeah. So I don't want to turn this into attack on our emergency. No, 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 no. Well, I didn't. I didn't. That wasn't mean that. what I was yeah. trying to set yeah. up there. Yeah. But we I, I think we should talk about uh, the second case. And then we are going to leave some time in a few minutes here for audience questions. So on, I, I kind of just want to breeze over the second case. So the okay. <laughs> so maybe not the second case. Yeah, I mean, so so essentially, we we've got this intern who is a little bit more bellicose, mm -hmm. who thinks he knows what he's doing, uh, who's providing some feedback to Arnie. The concern that I have uh, with this specific case is that he does not appear to have the insight to recognize that he, that he or she may be having an issue. So the question I wanted to punt to you was, well, what do we do about these, these, uh, these learners who may have some struggles, but yet are unable to perceive those same struggles? Yeah, I think the inability, that's, that's probably the hardest, right? Where the, the, challenge between the feedback you give the learner says you're wrong right i i had a my hmp was good you're wrong um i think in that setting again specificity is really important i think and i think sometimes you not with malice but with deliberate intent need to let them hang themselves a little bit um, I think we try very hard. Obviously, we don't want to ha make our, our learners feel bad in any kind of setting. But for someone who's overconfident like that, that's a dangerous place, right? Because right. if I don't know what I don't know, I won't get help. So I think asking the what if questions, asking the probing questions, and I think in some respects, 
the language you use when you give feedback is really important. Um, it depends a little bit where on the continuum the learner is, but I will tell learners, you are two standard deviations below where I would expect someone at your level. You know, mile stoning, mile, putting the mile markers out there. So not just that I would like to see you do better with this, but I worry that you can't put it together and you will hurt someone. I worry that you're not ready to be a resident yet. I think giving um, some sort, and again, for residents, we don't give them grades. For students, you can do it just by a grade, but for a resident, it's really important, I think, that you share your actual concern and put it in some sort of framework. How worried are you? What I've run into is where I will, I usually ask the resident what went well, what didn't go well. Hopefully they self-identify the problem. Sometimes you get lucky and they do, and then it's great. You can just come at it. Well, how, let's talk about how we can help you with that. And, you know, I agree. I did notice you struggled with that. But if, if they're like, no, I think everything's great. I'm, I'm doing a great job. And, and then, then you have to bring up, well, I noticed this professionalism issue or I noticed this issue where it seems like you're, you're, you're just saying everyone's okay and they're ready to go even when they're not. So I, I, you have to be very specific. Yeah. This is like going back to the behavior. Okay. You can't make the conclusion. You have to say, this morning on rounds with Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith, you told me that she was fine. And I walked in and her pulse was 130 and her blood pressure was 100 over 70. Okay. And she did not look well. Not that you sort of glossed over right. or can't tell sick from sick, but Mrs. Smith. And when they start to say, oh, yeah, well, you know, they, they, they start to give you all these excuses. That's the, the defensiveness to the feedback yeah. is the, I find that the most challenging sometimes. I think the more precise you can be with your feedback, yeah. it's harder to argue. Right. I also have to say, it's easier being the ageless clinician educator, right? I, I love this. Term. I got to start describing <laughs> yeah, myself. Right. Um, from, I am now ageless yeah, as well. I, yeah, like, I'm um, feeling that. Yes. Um, <laughs> Congrats, because, Madam, that's great. Well, you have gravitas, right? Yeah. I think for our junior educators, it is much harder. It is much harder. And sometimes when you have a learner who really is resistant, sometimes what I will do is keep asking, ask questions they don't know the answer to. And then reset that I actually do know more than you do. And this is, you know. I'm really um, learning a lot here today. Right, this is, right, you know. I didn't so, know I could do that. Yeah. Huh. I'm still kind of worried that I can't. Well, that's my concern. Is that I'll go well, sometimes that could you have backfire. to read a lot, but yeah, that, you have to prepare for it. That could it, backfire, okay. You have to prepare for it. So. Oh, man, I love that. Uh, guys, I think we're kind of running up to time for questions here. Uh, before we open up to the audience, Paul, Stuart, did you have anything else that you wanted to ask before we, we move in? Not, no, I, I, I think it pretty much, even though the script kind of went like this. Yeah, uh, like that's what we do, man. Yeah, I know, I know. Track, so, you know I mean, that. it's like, why even have all this stuff here? But we, we addressed it all, so that's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, why don't, uh, Stuart, you, I, don't trip over anything, but I think you were going to go maybe into the audience. Yeah, I'm going to try. We have a house mic and we have a mic for the podcast. And we'd love to, I'll, I'll give the audience some time if we don't have anyone with an immediate question, but uh, oh, you got a question here. Yeah, speaking of both of them, unfortunately. I can warm things up and, and thank you so much for visiting us here at UPMC, University of Pittsburgh. Um, so a question for Dr. McNeil, you know, one of the challenges is obviously that physicians are under immense stress. And we have very high rates of depression, anxiety, um, higher rates of substance use disorder, suicide. Maybe from a general standpoint, when should we worry that there's something more serious at play? And how do you, maybe you could give us an example of how you broach that subject with a colleague at your level, but also a colleague um, at, you know, as a supervisor. So I'm going to take the example of the, uh, let's say it's a resident, could be faculty, but who's always coming in late. And, you know, the first time you say, Fred, you're late. 
Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Dr. McNeil. I, you know, the, the alarm didn't go off. Second time, Fred, you're late. Yeah, I know, the bus didn't come. You know, and you get to the point where now it's a, a repeated pattern. And I, again, I don't name it as a professionalism issue. I say, Fred, recurrent lateness is a problem. And it's a problem because you're not giving yourself enough time to see your patients and you're not prepared for rounds. I worry when I see this that something else is going on. And I name it. I'm very clear. I say, I worry when I see this that this could be depression or misuse of substances. Because I have found that if you don't, they're never going to tell you unless you name it. If you name it and say, you know, and I, I always ask about these things because if these things are going on, these are things I can help you with, right? So you set it up as, I'm looking for depression, I'm looking for misuse of substances, and if those are there, it's okay, because I can help you with those. If you're just, you know, terminally disorganized, actually, that's harder to help with, right? You know, <laughs> substance abuse, man, I got a plan for you, you know? And so, so, so anyway, I name it. The other thing I've found, Mark, is that very often the... Um, individual will not disclose then, but if you have named it, mm -hmm. you then become somebody that they can come back and talk to when you're, they're ready to tell you about it because you've sort of put yourself out there as someone who might be able to help with this. So the other, I want to just say one other thing, which is, you know, we worry a lot about giving, I think, direct feedback because we worry about impairing people's wellness and their sense of well-being. I would argue that the best road to long-term wellness is being good at what you do. If we scoot you along and you're sort of, you know, perennially at the bottom of the pack, you're never going to be good. You're never going to feel confident. Problems will dog you for the rest of your life. Long-term wellness is about being good at what you do. Any other questions? Hi, what's your name? Uh, my name is Drew Klein. I'm a second year clinician educator fellow here. I was hoping, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the concept of feeding forward and particularly as a junior attending, when do you decide whether the next attending or the next resident even needs to know once you've identified that, that learner who's struggling? Yeah, I think that's, that's a hard question. Thank you, Drew. Um, and, I, and I also think it's one that people go both sides with, right? particularly in our day and age where faculty round for a week at a time, to not be able to share, it, it takes a long time to evaluate a learner, to figure out what's the matter, to decide what intervention you want to make and see if they get better. And if everybody reinvents that wheel every week, it's really hard to get better. We see a lot of um, learners, not a lot, some learners who have same problem identified for multiple evaluators and every evaluator said, but they're getting better, right? I think that you need to share specific behaviors if they rise to the level of concern that it is impairing their ability to learn and perform as they need to. I think um, that feeding forward should not be with every single encounter, right? Because then otherwise folks get labeled. Um, I also think that one of the things that we do here, both in the medical school and the residency, is when we feed forward, we feed forward up the chain. So having been a former chief, you will know this, you know, we're worried about Fred, Fred is a struggling learner. Um, we're going to give Fred to somebody we know is a thoughtful evaluator and we'll give feedback. So we, you know, some of the feeding for it is to share the behaviors. Some of the feeding for it is to pick the evaluator and then maybe check in a week later, right? How's Fred doing? Why? Why? What's happening? You know, no, Fred is good, you know. So. Yeah. And then you worry about why the educator is burning out sooner than all the other educators, right? Right, right. So Ro which, rotate your educators that you're giving the struggling learners. Well, actually, yeah. I, I, upon occasion, I will get a struggling learner, 
And actually, my current resident was distressed that I was there attending because they thought they were a struggling learner. I'm like, no, 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 no. Do we have time for another question? Hello. What's your name? My name is Carly Sokash. I'm an intern. Um, So one of the things that I struggle with is so much of direct observation, both at the med student and the resident level, happens on rounds and not in the direct context of taking care of a patient. So how do you identify a learner who may have excellent clinical knowledge, excellent differentials, excellent presentations, but just isn't connecting with patients and can't, like, they're missing that empathy, that, excuse me, that empathy piece? So I I actually think you can see that a lot on rounds, especially in our setting here. You watch the way they give feedback back to the patient. You watch the way that they... um, ask the patient questions. To be honest, I also find it out a lot when I round separately, you know, and you go and you talk to Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Smith is like, I'm so glad you're here, doctor. You know, and you're like, oh, well, aren't I special? But what you realize is that they didn't understand anything the learner said or the learner made them feel bad or the learner. So, so I think there are lots of clues. Ideally, the more direct observation in that setting would be the best, right? To go watch somebody do a history of physical or even a brief um, discussion. But we struggle with time. Yeah, and I think we're, speaking of time, I think we're just about at time to sign off. But that's, I think, bedside rounding. You watch the, the trainee give, you know, educate their patient, examine their patient. You can kind of get a sense. Um, Should we sign off, guys? Uh, I want to thank everybody for having us here. We want to end on time. So we will, uh, should we go to the outro? Thank you, Missy, so much for joining us. This was wonderful. If you want to sign off with us, Paul, do you want to read the outro? I feel like you should, yes. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) Listen, guys, I'm not proud of it. This is just what we're left with. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. That's right, Paul, because we're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge and to need. That's right, Paul, because we're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com or reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. <laughs> at The Curbsetters. As always, thank you to all of our team members, including our social media team, uh, producers, artists, and to our social media team. Man, I, whoever wrote the script. Okay, Hannah, that, that, keep going. Yeah, thanks. Hannah R. Abrams on uh, Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Stuart Kent Brigham. Uh, and thank you, Stuart, for the wonderful theme music that is uh, over my voice right now. Thank you to Claire Morgan for editing our audio. Uh, Claire at Notterly.com. And until next time, I've been Matthew Watto. This has been Missy McNeil. (laughs) And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thanks. Goodbye. Hey, Paul, you want a pun? No. So uh, I I hear that uh, here in in this wonderful state, you've had your own struggles recently. And uh, I have a diagnosis for Hahnemann Hossible. Yeah. It's a premature closure. Uh, Too soon? Yeah. Too soon? (laughs) 